August 2, 1958. Corleone Mafia boss Michele Navarro is driving down a quiet Sicilian country road in his Fiat 1100. Next to him is Giovanni Russo, not a gangster, but a doctor. Navarra, no ordinary boss, is also a doctor. Two cars block their way in the road. There's not enough space to turn back. Suddenly appearing at both sides of the road are men armed with submachine guns. They open fire. Hundreds of bullets tear them into pieces. The king is dead, and what will follow are decades of extreme violence. The man behind this historical hit was Luciano Leggio. He was once a young man who aspired to a life of crime. He was taken under the wing of Navarra and did some of his dirty work for him. It was almost a father and son story. One time, Leggio took out a trade union leader for Navarra, only there was a witness, an 11-year-old shepherd. Suffering from shock, his pop took him to a hospital which Navarra ran. He made the mistake of talking about what he'd seen, after which Navarra gave him a fatal injection. Leggio was saved from the law. But as time passed, Leggio had big ideas of his own. He started running his own rackets behind the boss's back. Soon, what was called the Cosca Leggiana, was at war with the Navarini. Prior to his death, Navarra tried to have Leggio shot down. It didn't work, and revenge came soon after. Leggio was now the Corleone boss. This set the scene for much of the violence that was to come. Leggio just taking a boss out like that of course resulted in him gaining a lot of enemies, but he also had an ace in the hole. That man was named Salvatore Toto Riina, who would in time become arguably the most brutal mafia boss that's ever lived. He was one of the men who fired a machine gun into Navarra's car that day. He would be the man to take over the Corleone family and do it in a style that painted Sicily and even the streets of the USA a lurid shade of red. Before any of this happened, the Sicilian Mafia in general had been growing in size for many years. From its beginnings around the 1850s when peasants rose up and formed violent gangs that extorted landowners, the families expanded and so did their power. One of those families was the Corleone family, the Corleonesi. The town of Corleone was tiny, just an outback. And that's why Mafia bosses from bigger towns and the city of Palermo would often say that they were the peasant mafiosi. Peasants maybe, but after Leggio took over, anyone against them was about to discover that the peasants meant business. It's a complicated story, but let's just say the Corleonesi had their allies and their enemies. Blood was spilled. So much so that in 1970, the Sicilian Mafia Commission was set up to ensure disputes didn't always end in bloodshed and business could run smoothly between the various families. Leggio was on that commission, but after he was imprisoned in 1974, the Mafia's most indomitable monster, Riena, took his place. This man wanted one thing, and one thing only. That was for the Corleonesi to be the most powerful family of all and for him to be the boss of bosses. To achieve that, he had to kill a lot of people, which, as you'll see, included untold numbers of gangsters but also their family members. Regular citizens would die, as would police, politicians, and some of the most renowned anti-mafia people in Italy. One man would have an entire country gripped in fear. It's said the Great Mafia War didn't really start until 1981, but it's also called the Second Mafia War. The first was a timid affair in comparison to what was to come. But let's just say that arguments over supplying Americans with heroin led to a massacre and some bullets in the back. The American heroin trade, like the cocaine trade today, meant bodies piling up far from North America. Those first skirmishes over heroin went back to the 1960s. But the narrative stayed the same in that there was always division, there was always backstabbing, there was always someone vying to take control. So much for honor among men. It was more like a zoo and the animals were armed. One of the men involved in the murders that happened around the time of the First War was Giuseppe Di Cristina, another powerful boss nicknamed the Tiger. He was also one of the first people to point out that the Corleonesi with Riena was planning to take over. It was kill or be killed, and he was killed. In 1978, while standing at a bus stop on the orders of Riena, De Cristina was shot down. Men close to him were also taken out at different times. The same year, also under the orders of Riena, the powerful boss Giuseppe Caterone was also taken out. Riena wanted it to look like someone else had done it. He even had mafiosi in tears at Caterone's funeral when he read a moving eulogy about how the man had been such a stand-up guy and a maker of peace. And this was before the war actually started. What really kicked it off was the murder of Stefano Bontade. He was one of the most powerful bosses of all and had equally powerful allies, so he was also a threat to Riena's rise to the top. Killing Bontade was no small deal. He had ties to politicians and those ties of course helped his friends. He once said this to another boss, we are in charge in Sicily, and unless you want the whole DC cancelled out, you do as we say. DC stood for the political party, Democrazia Cristiana, Christian Democrat. It was the statement of all statements to kill this man. On the 23rd of April 1981, while driving home in his Giulietta 2000, after celebrating his 42nd birthday, 
he was machine gunned down just outside the city of Palermo. Just three weeks later, another powerful Palermo boss, Salvatore Inzerillo, was killed. He just finished a date with his mistress when he was walking to the bulletproof car he'd just bought. A man appeared on the street and fired an AK-47 into him. He was hit so many times in the aftermath he barely looked human. This caused outrage. At his funeral, his 15-year-old son told everyone there that he would get his revenge. Not long after, he was kidnapped by Rihanna's hitman, Pino Greco. Prior to shooting him in the head, Greco cut off the young man's arm. Why? Because that was the arm he vowed to use to shoot Rihanna. Inzerillo's brother then had the audacity to ask the commission what was happening. He was strangled to death not long after. His other brother, another heroin trafficker, was soon found murdered far off in New Jersey. Rena was taking no risks. Everyone that might seek revenge had to go. The bloodshed wasn't exactly a secret. This is what the New York Times wrote about the conflicts and schisms. The underworld structure is a shifting one. With feuds over status and turf, the rule and equilibrium among rival gangs the exception. There has not been a chief of all chiefs in Sicily for many years. One was coming, but to get there, Rihanna had to murder a lot more people, more than anyone ever thought possible. How long will it take to crush the Mafia, the Times asked, unaware of how much crushing of its own the Mafia had in store. You might be wondering, how come the commission didn't stop all the bloodshed? Well, it's a complicated story, again, just as all these stories are. Basically, Giuseppe Di Cristina and Salvatore Inzerillo were part of the commission, and you know what happened to them. Another guy on the commission was Gaetano Badalamenti, a person of note. This guy was one of the main people behind the Pizza Connection, a billion and a half dollar enterprise in which heroin was trafficked to the US and sold out of pizza parlors. Long before the Mexican cartels and Big Pharma supplied strong opioids to desperate Americans, the Mafia did the job. Many became millionaires as a result, but the windfall meant fear and jealousy. Badalamenti wanted to go after Corleonesi, but the aging Salvatore Chasquitetu Greco, once the secretary of the commission, persuaded him and his allies to do otherwise. This was a man that you could say got a lot of respect, since his criminal prowess went way back to the days of the old school mafia. He might have moved to Venezuela in the 70s, but all that time he was forming alliances with the Italian-American mafia. In 1978, he passed away from liver cirrhosis just before the guys he tried to convince not to feud did feud. Of Rihanna and Leggio's main enemies, there was still Badalamenti alive and kicking. He was kind of alone now, so after being kicked out of the commission and realizing his days were likely numbered, he fled to Brazil, although he was still supplying heroin to the US from there. He was eventually extradited from Spain to the US and given a hefty prison sentence, although even in prison he had some control over his criminal activities. A New York Times reporter said this about him, He is a manipulator who would do anything to regain the leadership of the Sicilian mob. In 2002, he was convicted in Italy in absentia of killing Giuseppe Impastato. Impastato was a political activist who wasted no time in mocking and criticizing the mafia, and he often targeted Badalamenti in spite of knowing the dangers. Part of this was driven by the fact that the Mafia had killed his uncle. On the orders of Badalamenti, Impastato was murdered in 1978. His body was tied over a railway line and TNT was detonated below it, blowing him to pieces. Badalamenti died of natural causes in 2004 while still incarcerated in America. Critics of the Mafia, like Impostato, were slaughtered even if what they said didn't pose an immediate threat to operations. Giuseppe Fava was a journalist who wrote a critical piece for a magazine called The Four Horsemen of the Mafia Apocalypse. He was gunned down for that by a young man named Maurizio Avola. His uncle had given the order, but that was just one hit he did out of 70. Years later, Avola explained to Time Magazine how things went. He said, I was one of the most trusted killers and I was paid very well. I never queued at bars, clubs, at shops, or at restaurants. I never have to pay. My general sent me to kill people. I had to do it. Refusal was out of the question. Mafioso execute orders given from above just like soldiers at war. I've killed people with whom I've shared meals with and men who trusted me. If these stories sound somewhat labyrinthian, it's because they are. But all you need to know is that many people who stepped into the maze or were dragged into it were murdered. To give you another example, one of Badalamenti's nephews was found in Germany. His body had been dismembered. One of the main hitmen for Rihanna was Giuseppe Greco, an astonishingly violent man that once admitted to executing around 80 people for Rihanna. It was thought that he may have murdered as many as 300. He didn't work alone, of course. It's now known that he and others formed what was later called a death squad. These people would frequently use a room of death where people would be tortured before they were usually garroted. Their bodies would often be dissolved in acid, but at times they were fed to the pigs. On occasion, a person still breathing and half-conscious would be finished off by purposefully starved pigs. Greco was eventually assassinated himself, shot by the people he trusted. Rina didn't much like how big Greco thought he had become. 
Filippo Marchese was another member of the Death Squad who played a big part in Rihanna's rise to power. On the orders of Rihanna, he was garroted by Greco not long before Rihanna had Greco whacked. We're not going to go into all the members of the Death Squad, but let's just say that often out of sheer paranoia their boss would have them murdered just as he ordered them to murder others. Those guys just never knew if they'd be next. Some survived, although most ended up serving long prison sentences for scores of murders they'd been convicted of. One such man was Raffaele Ganci, said to be the right-hand man of Riena. He was sentenced to life in prison after being captured while on the run in 1993. Ganchi was said to be behind many hits of other mafiosi, but also of the military general Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa. He'd been tasked with cracking down on mafia activities in Palermo. Ganchi was also said to be behind car bombings that killed leading anti-mafia figures in Italy. Believe it or not, he's still alive today and doing time in Italy's dungeon-type solitary confinement cells. His son later turned and became witness to the prosecution, admitting himself to murdering around 100 people. This guy later said, My father told me that Cosa Nostra was ruined by the massacres decided by Riina. Riina was behind so much of this bloodshed his own body count would be in the thousands. Someone once said his violence was similar to ethnic cleansing. It was Riina who masterminded the execution of anti-mafia Giovanni Falcone, a man seen as a saint by many Italian people. You can also blame Riina for the execution of another great anti-mafia figure, Paolo Borsellino. Nonetheless, it's thought his assassination would have happened if it weren't for the help of people working for the Italian authorities. So many people in suits and uniforms were on the payroll, which made no place safe. For instance, Borsellino always kept a book on him that detailed what he knew. A lot of names are in that book, official ones too. That book mysteriously disappeared, something that has remained a mystery today. Around that same time, anti-mafia magistrate Rocco Canici died in a car bomb attack. The same bomb killed five others, including two bodyguards and the concierge of Kenichi's apartment. These high-ranking officials may have died after the Great War, but they died as a result of crackdowns that followed the war. They didn't stop at officials either. Innocent people were killed, again on the orders of Riina. A 904 express train from Naples to Milan was partly blown up by a bomb in 1984. 16 people died and over 250 people were injured. At this point, Riina had already become the boss of bosses. The bombing wasn't technically part of the Mafia War. It was, however, connected to it since it was devised as a way to take the heat off the Mafia by making it look like a terrorist attack. As the war was raging from 1981 to 1983, there were at least 400 Mafia slayings just in the city of Palermo. 200 more people or thereabouts disappeared and were believed to have been taken out by the Mafia. There was a name for this in Italian, Lupara Bianca, White Shotgun which meant completely getting rid of the body. Usually, they left the body as a statement, but not always. What's strange is that the Corleonesi didn't suffer that many casualties themselves, with experts now saying it was because they kept well hidden while their enemies were known to go out in public. They were sneaky as hell, too, and had little honor. Some people now say all honor went out of the window when Riena went on his rampage. For example, one time men who had allied with the murdered Bontade and Inzarillo were invited to a formal meal. They thought the invitation came from an ally when in fact the friend had turned and had set the guys up for Riena. Four men were slaughtered before they got a chance to taste the caponata. The man who had changed sides and lured them was boss and commission member Rosario Ricobono. After the favor, Riena's rationale was thus, if he can turn on his old friends, he can turn on me. He also knew if he took out Ricobono and all his men, he could hand over some of the territory to other families. It's ironic that so-called men of honor proved themselves to be the most dishonorable men in the world. In November 1982, Ricobono and eight of his men were invited to a banquet at the palatial house of one of Riena's allies. While Ricobono was catching some Z's after a big meal, his men were led away one by one for a private chat. They were each strangled to death. Ricobono died after his nap, although his body has never been found. A few days later, Ricobono's brother was found headless inside his car. Then they got the rest of Ricobono's crew and some of his family until anyone who'd been allied with him was dead. The only survivor was his driver, Salvatore Lo Piccolo. Piccolo later became one of the most powerful mafiosi that ever lived, and he made his fair share of enemies. A wiretap conversation revealed that one of those enemies said he was one who should have died. He was the godson of Ricobono and should have gone. He ended up making tens of millions from trafficking cocaine to the US and around Europe, only to be arrested in 2007 in front of his daughter who cried out, I love you, dad. Yep, murderers and thieves also read their kids' bedtime stories. Piccolo survived Riena's wrath, but in reality no one was safe in the early 80s, not even those aligned with Riena if he started seeing them as a threat. Still, he became the boss and once his natural mafia enemies had been taken care of, he concentrated on what the mafia called excellent cadavers. 
The first of these in Mafia history had been Emmanuel Notarbatolo, arguably the first anti-Mafia proponent. He was viciously stabbed to death while traveling through a train tunnel in 1893. Just as the Mafia war was getting started, Pirsanti Mattarella, the president of the regional government of Sicily, was assassinated. Pretty much all the big names in the Mafia were said to be behind the murder. In 1982, Pio Latorre and his driver were shot to pieces while in their car. Latorre was a communist leader and a person whose whole life had been dedicated to fighting for the poor. Prior to his death, he'd brought in a new law. That was Mafia Conspiracy, and it meant assets could be taken from the Mafia if those assets were ill-gotten. That didn't go down too well with the bosses. They blew up and gunned down top police and any street cops that got in their way. Judges got it, as did political figures. We won't go into all their stories, but understandably people started saying enough is enough. After the war, as you know, Rihanna had assassinated some of the people who'd helped him rise to power. He also still kept killing anyone he thought was against him. One of the survivors later said that if you didn't do as Rihanna said, you were good as dead. But this kind of destroyed the demi-democracy that the Mafia once had. Some mafioso watched too many people die. They had had enough and talked to the cops, such as Leonardo Messina. He said Rihanna used to get rid of the old bosses. They got rid of all those who raised their heads. All that's left are men without character, who were their puppets. State witness Pentito Salvatore Cortono described it like this. The winning and losing clans don't exist because the losers don't exist. They, the Corleonesi, killed them all. That's why the Mafia War was called Matanza in Italian, meaning the slaughter. How many people died in all? It's hard to say. One of Rihanna's guys, named Giovanni Brusca, the man who pushed the button that blew up Falcone, said he personally took out up to 200 men. He was just one of many prolific killers. Rihanna himself was captured in 1993 and he died in prison in 2017 of natural causes. He was 87 and still said to be the boss. Now you need to watch what does the mafia even do anymore? Or have a look at crazy Italian mafia crimes.